All right, let me see your Bibles, all Bibles, hold them in the air. Good job, y'all. Electronic Bibles, can I see those, please? Electronic Bibles. Hold them up. If you do not have uh, an electronic Bible on your cell phone, please use the QR code on the paper that was just passed out and get the church app. It's free and on, in, included in that app uh, is a Bible app. And so uh, you won't have to know in what order the books of the Bible are. You can just click it and then the chapter and then the verse and you're there. Uh, you can go ahead and turn to the book of Acts, chapter 1. You can also turn to me to 1 Corinthians, chapter 14. In 1 Corinthians, chapter 14, verse 39, it says very specifically to not forbid speaking in tongues. So I have heard my whole life as I was growing up I would, hear, I would hear people that would pray in tongues, and even without looking up, typically I could tell who was praying based on what it sounded like. In fact, um, when we're being not overtly holy, uh, it is funny to hear Nicholas uh, mimic individuals' prayer languages, and he can do it with such precision it just it gets my funny bone almost every time he can do nigel to a t um and so i think the question has got to come at some point how does a repre a repetitive phrase or a repetitive uh group of syllables and sounds produce new and or different messages each time it's released. How many's ever thought that to yourself before? How in the world can somebody say A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and today it's interpreted as one message and that same group of sounds next week is interpreted as a completely different message? How many's ever had that question in your own heart and mind whether you voiced it or not? Okay, I have. So I'm old enough to remember the days of dial-up internet. Who in the room is old enough to remember dial-up internet? How many's used dial-up internet? Look around the room. Okay, so there is a sound called the handshake, and that, that's, it sounds very, very similar to a fax machine. How many's ever listened to fax machines? Whenever you dial the phone number and it calls up and you hear the other, uh, the other side ring and then it answers and then you hear this, this uh Max Hedrum kind of sounding stuff where they're talking back and forth. And then after the handshake is over, then all you hear is white noise. Just and all of a sudden, it starts spitting out uh, pages of text or pictures or whatever else that comes through that white noise. And so when I was preparing this message last week, I had that thought again. In fact, last week I actually played it, but just so that Nicholas doesn't have to chop it out. How many remembers the AOL sounds, right? It uh, makes my skin crawl. I heard it so, so many times. And so um, it's the same thing that when you are trying to download information off the Internet, it's all done through that sound. <laughs> and isn't it interesting that all data that we see on the computer, on our cell phones, on, on any type of electronic device, our tablets, are you aware that all of that information is presented in ones and zeros? Pictures are made out of ones and zeros. Text is made out of ones and zeros. And so if ones and zeros can create different photos and different texts, isn't it amazing that those same syllables that are repetitively said could also have different message with different photos, with different visuals, with different messages, with different everything? Do you see what I'm saying? And so God uses sound and in some instances, I would suggest even white noise in order to get his word released. Now, I don't have time to go into a message that I would really like to delve into right now that, that speaks of words. So let me just give you an illustration about words. Words are a vehicle that carries a message to another. Words are a vehicle. 
So in the same way, if you put a letter in the mail and the postman delivers it to your house, he is the delivery mechanism. So you wrote a message, it's delivered to the recipient, the recipient opens that message and receives it. That's what words are. Even right now, as they're coming up in my own heart and mind, and I'm releasing them through my mouth, you're hearing words. And when those words get in your ear, it's decoded to have a message, and you go, oh, that's what he meant based on the sound that carried that message to me. You follow me? And so tongues is no different. Tongues is, is God enveloping his message in sound and released into this realm because, watch, he watches over his to perform it. So that God needs partnership with you and I to release an appropriate message that he can function with because too often if we're left to our own devices and our own brain and our own understanding, we pray messages that are, or, 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 or pr pray prayers rather, that are too elementary for God to be able to release what he needs to release. Try going to a doctor, and they try to give you a prescription, and so they're telling the pharmacist they just need something to make them feel better. They don't tell them names this long and, and you know, write scripts or whatnot. That it's just, hey, they feel bad. Can you give them a pill? Well, yeah, there's a lot of pills. Which one do we need to get? Are they going to have an allergic reaction? Is it going to shut down kidneys? Is it going to mess with their head? Is it going to be psychotropic? Is it all this stuff? So we need specificity. We can't just pray, God, give them a pill. You see what I'm saying? And so God releases words with such specificity that he can absolutely minister to and through that word to fix and, and solve a situation that we're praying over. Make sense? So, in essence, tongues really is a language. And I know there's a lot of people that will say, and we're fixing to get into it in Acts chapter 2, listen, you know, uh, Hyundai, Shandai, Untama, Bowtie, saying that ten times fast, does not a language make. And while I understand that in the natural, we're not praying in the natural at that point. We're praying in the supernatural at that point. And so things that sound ridiculous in the natural can be used by God to release the supernatural. It's kind of like deliverance. I've stopped telling people when we're going to do deliverance unless I'm going to teach specifically on that, right? And so many times I won't even tell them that what we're about to do is deliverance because if I said, hey, what we're about to do is deliverance, and they'd get upset at me and say, well, how dare you think that I have a devil? So now I just say, listen, just pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I repent. Lord Jesus, I repent for blah, 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 for blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden start, stuff starts leaving their life, and they go, wow, I felt that. that. I feel so much different. And what was that? Well, that was just God, you know, ministering his grace into your life. I don't have to tell them it's deliverance for it to be deliverance. It's just like the kid who doesn't want to take their medicine, so they get, a, they get a Capri Sun or a juice box, and they put the medicine right behind it, and they, and they stab the straw all the way through it into the medicine and say, you want some of this? Oh, yeah. And they suck that all down, and they think it's wonderful because in their mind, they're drinking Capri Sun or a juice box when really they're getting... That's what I got to do with y'all sometimes. That's, what, that's why the graphics and the, and, and the titles and whatnot can be a little bit different than what you think it's going to be getting in here because if you knew what it was before you got here, you wouldn't show up. So Acts chapter 2. Many of those that teach that speaking in tongues is a known natural language. How many ever heard that? Tongues is a known natural language. And so if you're not speaking a known natural language, then you're really not speaking in tongues. How many ever been taught that or heard that? I've heard that a bunch. Here's where they get that in Acts chapter 2, verse 4. And it says, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together, and they were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. And then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? 
And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and those dwelling in Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speak in our own tongue the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? So on the surface, you have 120 disciples that have met together in Jerusalem in the upper room waiting on the promise of the Father. So when they are filled and they all begin speaking in other tongues, it, there's quite a commotion. And the Bible says there were people from every nation of the world that had gathered round about, and all the people that gathered, though they couldn't understand each other, everybody understood, watch, all 120. So let's just say there's 120 of us here in the room right now, and all of a sudden we all begin to just begin to speak in tongues. And so here I am, and let's just say I'm Egyptian. And so I happen to be walking through, and as I, as I get close over here, I'm hearing her speak in my tongue. But yet I come over here, and she's speaking my tongue, and he's speaking my tongue, and he's speaking, and she is. And, but yet when the next person who's African comes behind me, they're hearing each person in their native tongue. Her tongue hasn't changed. The Bible didn't say that she was speaking in their native tongue. The Bible says that every person heard what they were speaking, heard it in their native tongue. Let me give you an example. The old adage, hey, baby, how does this dress make me look? Does this dress make me look fat? Right? So you got to be very, very careful in that scenario because if you say yes, then, oh, so you're saying I'm fat. No, you asked me the question, does the dress cause you to look as though you were? So they asked the right question, but they interpreted the answer completely wrong because it was interpreted based on what they thought you meant not on what you said. You catch that? So you can imagine the confusion that was happening when you have this mixed group of people who can't understand each other, but yet every one of them is understanding their own language coming out of one person who's speaking simultaneous. That's why they were just looking at each other. How, how does this happen? You understand that too? This whoa. And everybody heard what was being spoken as a testimony of the wonderful works of God. How can you know that when you're speaking in tongues that it really is real? I'm going to tell you the real difference. The real difference is when faith is applied. When faith is applied, God can use it. When all you have is what you heard somebody else say, but God's not involved in it, then you have the same sound, but it's empty. Remember, it's, it's an envelope that carries a message. It's an empty envelope if the Lord's not involved with it. Is it for today? Look at Acts 2.38, please. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. So Peter said to them, Amend your lives and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Verse 39. For the promise, what's the promise? The Holy Ghost. The promise is made to you, to your children, and to all that are afar off. That means in future generations, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So for all those that say tongues ceased with the apostles, by the very words of Peter the apostle, it didn't cease with the apostles because he said, this is for you and your children. Well, you know the children outlive the apostles. So we already know that by their own argument that it ceased with the apostles, that it didn't cease with the apostles because he just said, for those that were there, for it's for you and your children and to future generations, as many as the Lord our God shall call. This is for everybody. So if it's real, it didn't stop, and it's for today, then why? And so I'm going to make tracks today, okay? Number one, 
Why does God use tongues? Number one, it speaks mysteries directly to God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2, for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Now that just violates what a lot of people said about Acts chapter 2. Every person heard the wonderful works of Jesus in the tongues that the, that the apostles, there are 120 in the, in the upper room rather, were praying. Right? So they would say it's a natural language. And it was for them. No, that was a miracle because we understand that tongues is not meant for me to talk to you or to you or to you. Tongues is meant for me to speak mysteries to the Lord. Finish that verse. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. So I've been asked this repetitiously. So are you telling me that the devil cannot understand what I'm speaking in tongues? Yes. Are you telling me that people can't understand what I'm speaking in tongues? Yes. Are you telling me that I can't understand what I'm speaking in tongues? There's times, yes. You say, well, what's the point of that? Here, here's what I'm going to tell you. Many times God has wanted to do something for you, in you, or through you that if you knew what it was ahead of time, you would never pray that prayer. So he calls you to speak that in the spirit so that it releases him to bring it to pass in your life because it's needful both for you and for him. But he knows that if you had knowledge of that ahead of time, you wouldn't obey. That's why when you were a little junior woodchuck going to elementary school and you got in trouble, the teacher wrote a note to your parents telling you, telling the parents how mean you were in class. And then they pinned it to the back of your shirt where you couldn't get it. Right? So you wound up carrying a message you would have never told your parents. But you carried it. That's what tongues does. It causes you to carry a message that you would never willingly utter for yourself. <laughs> Some of y'all ain't even know what to think right about now. Number two, tongues is edification or encouragement for the one speaking. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3, but he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies or encourages himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. And then I hear people say, so, so see there, it's not even important that we, that we speak in tongues. We just need to prophesy instead of speaking in tongues. Now we're going to get into that in, in just a little bit too. But I want you to grab this. If prophecy still exists, then tongues has to exist. Either the gifts ceased or or they're still here. So if you, if you believe that somebody can prophesy, but they can't speak in tongues, then you're violating your own argument that this ceased with the apostles because prophecy is still a gift. Remember whose tongues for? People or God? God. Who's prophecy for? People or God? people. So they have different functions. We need them both, but they have different functions. Speaking in tongues edifies the one who's speaking it. That's like the mailman or the postman who delivers your message. He's getting paid to deliver that to your house. He doesn't know what it is. He released it, but he's still getting a benefit for doing it. We get a benefit for releasing it, whether we understand what's in it or not. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, 14, it says, when we speak in tongues, our spirit prays, but our mind is unfruitful. Do you know that there are technological illustrations today that you can pull up on YouTube where willing volunteers will go into a doctor's office and go under an MRI, and then they would tell them, okay, whenever you're ready, just start praying in the Spirit. How many have ever seen those? How many have ever seen those? And so they're laying on this, on this table, this MRI, that's, that's actively scanning their brain. 
So they're engaging them in conversation, and so there's p- particular portions of your brain that's going to light up as you're having conversation because that part of your brain is, is working. But when that, when that person began to speak in tongues, the part that lit up in conversation went dark. And other areas of the brain that never light up begin to light up. Yeah. Why is that? Because the Holy Spirit is using us to do what we didn't understand. So new areas of our brain are lighting up. Y'all ain't hear nothing I'm saying. Because if it was a natural language, the same areas would light up as would light up right now as I'm talking to you in English, but it didn't. So it's the Spirit that's using the flesh. So the, the flesh has to be involved, right? Or it wouldn't be released, But it's not the same area of the brain that activates the mouth and the vocal cords to release it when it's coming from the spirit. So when the spirit says, hey, I want to release something, different parts of the brain light up to release that than our typical areas for for speech. I thought that was a pretty cool illustration. Number three, tongues help us to enter and to rest. 1 Corinthians 14, 21. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips I will speak to this people, and yet for all that they will not hear me, says the Lord. Paul is quoting this scripture from Isaiah 28, verse 11 through 12, and he's using this verse to explain speaking in tongues. That says, for with stammering lips and another tongue, he will speak to this people to whom he said, this is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Did you catch what he's saying here? Tongues is a rest and a refreshing. The Bible tells us that there is rest for God's people in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4, and that we're to be diligent to enter into that rest. Speaking in tongues is a tool that God has provided for us to access that rest. So why is tongues a tool to enter into that rest of God? Because in the new covenant that we're under, Paul said in in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 5, our sufficiency is from God who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter but of the spirit. For the letter kills but the spirit gives life. And in the same chapter, verse 17, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed in the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So when we learn to, to release ourselves in God's care, then it doesn't matter what comes out of our mouth. Can I, can I be a little bit of a devil's advocate in the middle of this message? Huh? How many of you watched the debate? How many did not watch the debate? How many seen highlights of the debate? How many, how many, <laughs> how, how many saw the current president as he was giving the, the Medal of Honor a day or two ago? How many saw that? How many did not see that? So let me tell you how it went down. He has teleprompters. He's got one over here and one over here. So you can't see them, but he's looking this direction, reading, then he moves over here, and he's back and forth as he's reading the story of historical events that took place. And you go, wow, he's on top of the mark. Listen to him. He's coherent. He makes sense. He's got full sentences. This this is amazing. And and the truth is he's reading it because when he got there, there's no way he was going to memorize all of that, and he needed, watch this, to rest So he was able to allow his mind to rest because all he had to do was read. So when we are hearing from God, I don't have to have a word. I don't have to have revelation. I don't have to have all the stuff that you would typically want to do. But when God gives a a word and, and I release that, my brain can relax and my body can relax because now I know he is speaking. And all I got to do is release what he's saying. That's like you being on the phone and somebody's making a, a wedding cake 
and the recipe is lost. And so you call grandma or you call mom and you say, hey, what's the recipe? And they say, they say, put in two boxes of white cake mix. And so you say from the phone, hey, put in two boxes of white cake mix. Okay, now what? Well, it takes six eggs. You need six eggs. I'm at rest because it doesn't matter what the recipe is. I'm not going to get it wrong because all I got to do is say what mama's saying. Y'all ain't hearing anything. So when you are only saying what God is saying, you can be at total rest in your mind, in your heart, in your spirit, and everything. You don't have to be all tense and freaked out. Why? Because you're at rest, because all you're doing is saying what God is giving you to say. Number four, tongues is a sign to unbelievers. <laughs> uh, when we were in restaurants, I don't know what you told people to get them to show up other than, hey, show up and get some chicken fried steak or some breakfast, you know, some coffee, cinnamon rolls. If you thought the whole thing was a terrible experience, at least you're going to eat. And uh, so people had no, I, no idea or no understanding of what kind of group that this actually was. And so in the ministry portion, it was not uncommon for me to start speaking in tongues. And I saw people twitch and get nervous in their seats and get up and, I mean, take off and just get out of there, making a door almost where there was no door because the very idea of tongues freaked them out. Now, listen, Rachel and I enjoy some Thai food on occasion. And when the, when the wait staff is talking to each other, it sounds very foreign. And it sounds like a bunch of syllables and consonants just stuck together in a way that is just jumbled, right? But at no point do I jump up and run for the door because I don't understand the language. Do you see what I'm saying? And so just because something is being said in a way that you don't understand it, that ought not freak you out. So let me just suggest to you, it's not the fact that they heard a language that they didn't understand that freaked them out. I'm going to tell you what happened is when the Holy Spirit begins to speak and it comes out in the form of tongues, they're, they're bypassing what they're hearing and they're sensing something that freaks them out because the Holy Spirit is making his presence known to them. And so they're hearing something that's odd and they blame that to run and to bolt when the truth is they're they're uncomfortable. I see that happening even today. I don't mean today meeting this moment. I mean today in today's time where when the, when the spirit begins to move and a word is released or prophecy is released or healings begin to take place, there are people that get very, very uncomfortable and they bolt for the door and they'll make all kinds of excuses that I had to go to the restroom or my stomach's been upset or I just had to go out and take a smoke and you know all this stuff, right? It's anything to get out of the room. Why? Because when the presence of God shows up, people that don't know who he is know who he is. Y'all didn't hear that. People that have never met him still perceive. It's just, like, it's just like Saul when he got knocked off his donkey and he got up blind and he said these words, Who are you, Lord? So even somebody who did not know God came up off the ground recognizing that the being that put him on the ground and blinded him had to be God. You catch what I'm saying? Here's our problem with church. We have dumbed church so totally down. We have watered it so totally down that there's no power, there's no anointing, there's no conviction, there's no healing signs, wonders, miracles, there's nothing. Why? Because we, we found a system that God used to use, but God vacated that system a long time ago. How many has ever been on the seashore and you find a bunch of seashells? Something used to live in that shell, but it ain't there no more. And what we've done is we've found these places where, where the presence of God used to be. And we think that because we're hanging out where God used to be, that that's holy because God vacated it. If you want to be holy, you got to go with him. He told Abraham, he said, go to a land that I will show you. That, that was God saying, I'm leaving. You're either coming with me or you're staying here without me, but I'm going. You hear what I'm saying? And that's why we cannot get stuck uh, I'm kind of giving you a glimpse into another message I think the Lord has stirred in me. We've got people that go to graves and will take better care of a grave with a corpse beneath the dirt than they will their own life and their own walk with Jesus. 
There's too many people today that honor the dead more than they do the living. They honor the dead more than they do than God. And by the way, God's not dead. So it's a sign for under, uh, uh, unbelievers. <laughs> I almost said underbelievers. I think that's a new term. There are many testimonies of God using the gift of tongues to be assigned to unbelievers. Most of the, of the stories that I've heard in this way came from those on missions trips um, where somebody might be in Africa, Ethiopia, um, Philippines, whatever, and they're preaching and their interpreter gets sick or something or they don't even realize it and as they're preaching in their own tongue, all of a sudden, all the people there are able to understand them, and the interpreter also understands them, so they stop interpreting. That's a miracle. That's God using tongues as a miracle and a sign and a wonder to the people. Number five, tongues is equal to prophecy when interpreted. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 5, I wish you all spoke with tongues, Paul speaking, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. Let's see if I can put it in a different illustration. I like to eat. I enjoy it. It is a fun pastime for me. So if I brought a meal and I sat down right here while you're watching and I ate, that's the equivalent of me speaking in tongues in your presence. It's not for you. It edifies me, but it ain't helping you. Prophecy is if I brought a plate for everybody because everybody gets to eat in prophecy. So Paul is saying if, if there's a choice, I'd rather you prophesy because then everybody can profit from it because if you're just speaking in tongues, that's between you and God. You're getting edified and you're speaking ministries to God, but that's not doing anything for the masses. Do you see what he's saying? So both of them have a place. If, if I am putting up pickets on a fence and I have a hammer and a wrench and you're going to help me and you have a hammer and a wrench, I would tell you I would prefer that you use the hammer. That will help to get the job done. That's what Paul's saying. You got two tools in the toolbox. I, if that's the choice, prophesy. He's not saying tongues is invalid or less than. He's just saying if you're doing this in front of everybody, then make it something they can use. They can't use the tongues because it's in code. So use prophecy that's in their own language so they can be encouraged too. Okay? I don't know how many times I've caught myself, even in this church, I'll be walking up and down the aisles, and all of a sudden, I'll begin to pray in tongues, and then out of that, I'll have a word for somebody. So I just believe that God is speaking something into the atmosphere and then giving me the interpretation that ministers directly to a person. So you have both the tongue and the interpretation. You catch what I'm saying? So let me just address this now. I've had so many conversations with people who I believe their heart is right. So I don't get upset because I believe their heart was in the right, right place. But they'll say, listen, you should never speak in tongues where somebody can hear you unless there's an interpreter. Okay? So... Let, let me just be straight with you. That's, that's a Baptist interpretation. And I, I'm not bashing them. I'm just telling you, that's a Baptist interpretation. 
So l- l- let me see if I can if I can make sense of this to you. If I said, baby, I left my water in the office. Would you mind going and getting it for me? Did you hear that? Was it to you? So if I am speaking, and I don't mean shouting, trying to get everybody's attention, but if I'm just speaking in tongues and you overhear it, I mean, there's some Sundays when I'm talking to my wife and I say, hey, baby, where do you want to go eat? Well, I don't know. We had Mexican yesterday, so I'm thinking maybe we ought to do something a little different, maybe some chicken or some, some steak or you know, something a little bit different. And there's people around us that's overhearing that. Does that mean we should shut up and go in private because they're, you, you catch what I'm saying? I'm being a little facetious to prove the point. So just because you hear it does not mean it needs to be interpreted because if you're, if you're eavesdropping on my conversation to God, that's on you, not on me. Okay, but if if a word in tongues is released for the body and you go, how do you know it's for the body? My mom is a perfect example of that. My whole life, I can tell both in intensity and in decibel level whether or not she's praying for her or whether or not God is giving her a word for the body. So if if we're in a in a holy moment, and everybody's just praying and, and different ones are praying in, in their prayer language and whatnot. And all of a sudden I hear a mom about two decibels above them, five decibels above them. 10 decibels above them, then at that point, I start getting quiet to find out, is she going to go to 50 or is she going to go back down to two, right? And I wait because if she, if she keeps going and she goes up to 50, then I know, pay attention, that's a word for the body because mom doesn't pray at 50 if it's for her. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, uh, Sister Charlene was here, and she began to pray, and her tongues began to get elevated and elevated, and it got about a third of what I would I would consider the volume for a word for the body. And so I paused a second to find out, is she going to go the distance? Is it going to get more or is it going to go back down? And so what I perceive happened is she was, she was praying in the spirit and she was getting personally blessed. And as a part of getting personally blessed, it just got a little bit more animated, a little bit more volume, but it didn't elevate to the point that I knew, okay, she's releasing a word for the body. You can tell when somebody's releasing a word for the body, not just in intensity and in in volume, but everybody else who has any kind of Holy Spirit in them, they recognize, they go, oh, whoo, that's God speaking. I'm going to shut up and sit down right now because that is a holy moment. I'm going to listen to what he's saying. And then when they get done, there's just a quietness until somebody who has the gift of interpretation is able to release what that meant. Does that make sense? So just because you hear somebody praying in tongues because, guys, I'm tell, I've told you this before, uh, and I feel repetitive because the last time we recorded this, the audio wasn't there, but I'll just be driving down the road. No prompt, no anything. And I'll, just, I'll be singing a song or just sitting in silence, and all of a sudden I'll just break out in tongues. Whether somebody's in the car with me or not, I don't care if they're there. You're eavesdropping on my conversation, you know what I'm saying? And so, so it's just in and out all the time. And I, I want to be accessible. I want to be a minute man for God. That if he needs something released, because I don't know when I'm driving down this neighborhood, if somebody's about to, if they're eating the barrel of a gun, and as I'm driving by, the Lord says, release this word. And I just release this word in tongues. And God interprets that to the devil and says, you better stand down. I'm going to snatch you up right now. You know, I don't know. I don't know what I'm releasing. It's not for me to know. I'm supposed to be the male person who releases that into the atmosphere for God to do whatever he wants to do with it. I remember when my dad was working on, on cars as I was growing up. I mean, he always had a wrench in his hand or fixing appliances or whatnot. And so he'd say, son, go get me a 7 16th box in wrench. So I'd run out to the garage, I'd find a 7 16 box in wrench, I'd come running back in, he'd hold his hand up, just like a, a surgeon, you know, just slapping in his hand, and, and he'd take it. Now, I didn't say, now, Dad, what are you going to do with that? Are you putting that on the right nut? Are you putting that on the right bolt? Are you, are you shorting something out? What are you doing? It's not, it's not my job. My job was to deliver the wrench. What he did with it is on him, same way with tongues. In 1 Corinthians 14, 27. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two, or at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there's no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. 
this, this is real simple. Somebody says, well, I don't know if I should release a word in tongues to the body because I don't know if there's an interpreter. God's not going to have you release a word in tongues to the body if there's not an interpreter. Right. You catch that? Right. Okay, so it, 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 why does he say only two or three? What he's saying is, I know you all got the gift, and I know you all are capable of releasing that. But at some point, we got to keep things decently in an order. And this is not just a gift fest. This is if God releases something for the body. So I know you can show off and show out and flex your stuff and show people that you can do that, and God will honor that. But at, at the same time, there are other things that God wants to accomplish in the service. So two, three at the most. And if there's no interpreter, then quit strutting your stuff that you can, that you can, that you can speak in tongues and just keep it to yourself between you and God. So Paul, while deep in wisdom, is also just being real. <laughs> Listen, I know some of y'all in this room can carry four or five chairs at a time. I don't need you to do it right now because if you did it right now, it'd be out of order. That's the essence of what Paul is saying. I know you're capable, but there's, a, there's an appropriate time. How many times when I was a kid and mom and dad had somebody over to play cards or, or instruments or whatnot, and, I, and I, I, I wanted their attention, dad, 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 he's talking, dad, dad. He'd look and say, son, do you see me having an adult conversation right here? I know you're here. You just stay put, and as soon as I have a pause here, I'll talk to you. He was teaching me order. Because if I can't pay attention to dad teaching me how to do order in the natural, how in the world am I going to pay attention when God says, now, son, now, or hang on to that? So people were so enamored with, whoo, I got the gift, that God had to use Paul to tell him, I'm glad you got the gift. Contain it. You see what I'm saying? He goes on in verse 13. He says, therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. And I've had people say, well, I've heard people that pray in tongues, and then they wind up interpreting their own tongue. I just don't think that's right. There ought to be somebody who prays in tongues, and then there also be an interpreter. I've seen it both ways. And according to this scripture in 1 Corinthians 14, it's legitimate. If you're praying in tongues, and you trusted God to release that word in tongues, why not trust him for the interpretation? And if he gives it to you, share it. If he doesn't, he gives it to somebody else, let them share it. Who cares? Got so many people trying to tell us how we're using the gift wrong that they don't even believe it exists. I'm just, I'm just tired of the fallacy. Number six, praying in tongues is a way to receive personal revelation. Isaiah 28, verse 9. Whom will he teach knowledge? And whom will he make to understand the message? Those just weaned from the milk? Those just drawn from the breasts? For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue, he will speak to this people. He's teaching us that there are steps and ways that build upon each other. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit, capital S, who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words, which man's wisdom teaches, but the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. I hope that I'm speaking to a group of people who's still not trying to make up their mind whether or not tongues is for today. And I hope I'm dealing with people that are saying, just tell me how and when to use it. God does not release anything accidentally. If God released something to you and I, it's intentional, and it has a purpose. There's no gift given by God that doesn't have a purpose. Right. 
Number seven, speaking in tongues is praise and thanksgiving. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 14. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. So what's the result then? What's the conclusion? I will pray with the spirit, and I will also pray with understanding. I will sing with the spirit, and I will also sing with understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with the spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks since he does not understand what you say? For you indeed will give thanks well, but the other is not edified. We used to sing a song, put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Lift up your voice to God. Pray or praise. I don't remember which one it was. Maybe it's praise. Praise in the spirit and with understanding. Oh, magnify the Lord. Put it this way. God understands what I'm saying when I'm praying in English. God understands what I'm praying when I'm praying in tongues. I don't need to understand what I'm saying for God to get what he needs and for it to bless me. So God is saying, if you will speak as I give you the utterance, it's feeding your spirit man. How many times do you come to church and your social need is met, your physical touch need is met from all the handshaking and hugs, but sometimes you leave and your spirit man is empty and his, stu- his, his spiritual stomach is growling because there was no sustenance. Now, I know that doesn't happen here. You catch what I'm saying, though? So your spirit man needs to be fed. Sometimes, sometimes my wife will just walk up to me and hand me some pills and say, take this. I might be acting irritable, angry, anxious. She goes to the cabinet, and she'll herb me to death. She'll bring me some cayenne. She'll bring me some magnesium. She'll bring me some whatever, right? Vitamin C, if I'm getting a sore throat, I mean, she'll take this. And because of my trust for her, I will take for my person... Watch this. What I didn't have the capacity to recognize that I needed for myself. So there are times when our heart is bent towards God. But we don't know what we need. So he calls us to pray in the spirit that puts medicine in our spirit that's what our spirit needs even though our brain is going, nothing really happened. Not to you. Does that make sense? There's times that I'll come in the sanctuary with my notebook. And I'll put some music on like what we got going on right now. And I'll pray in English for a little bit. And then I'll pray in tongues for a little bit. And then I'll just get quiet. And I'll keep that notebook and that pen close. And I have found that invariably I will get inspired. And I will write not just a statement, but page after page after page after page that I believe was released because I prayed and depleted myself of everything that I knew that I should to God. I took care of the natural. Then the Holy Spirit spoke through me mysteries. And God took those mysteries and said, Here's a little bit of what that one meant. And I'm just like, and I go back days, weeks, months, or years later, and I'm blessed all over again every time I read it because that didn't come from my intellect. That came from God.
this came from the Lord. And any time you read it, it will encourage, discipline. So if the Lord speaks a word to you and you write it down, it has the capacity to bring the encouragement like the Scripture does. If it's from God, it's from God. I'm not saying it's a different revelation. Anything that you believe that God's given you yourself has got to line up with this book or it didn't come from God. You catch what I'm saying? So anytime you read it, I go through files sometimes and I'll find cards that my wife wrote me or little, little love notes that she dropped here or there. And, and when I read them, even though it's years later, I still find myself getting encouraged from what she said 20 years ago. Because it was intentional and it was meant for me. This is intentional and it was meant for me. This was intentional and it was meant for me. Nancy, I don't have it out here, but here's my little soapbox uh, message right now. I think too often people come to church to get encouraged by me. And you don't understand that it's not me that it's encouraging you. Because what I'm giving you is not from me anyway. I'm just the postman. So if you wind up getting blessed, it's not because I said it. It's because I was faithful to release it. Not because I was the one that said it. Rachel is just as capable of being behind this, this podium, this, this desk, and releasing a word that came from the heart of God for you. And if you judge whether or not it came from God by who spoke it, then you're missing it because that's intellect. That's why you've got to pay attention to what's being released. And when your spirit goes, that's a word from the Lord, you pay attention to this even if you don't like the person and you can't stand their personality type. Yeah, I'm going to say it too. There, there are people, no doubt, that don't come here because they don't like my personality. You're not here for my personality. You want my personality, go to lunch with me. I have plenty to give. But it's not about my personality when we're in this forum. It's about releasing what God gave. So don't like me. But don't miss what God's saying because he chose to use somebody to release it that you didn't like. Don't dismiss the word because you didn't like the messenger. Number eight. Speaking in tongues can be the, can be the initial sign of receiving the Holy Spirit. I'm going to go as far as to say it is, it is the predominant um, sign of, of the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Am I going to say dogmatically 110% of the time that it's only tongues? I'm not going to do that because there are other gifts in the Spirit. I'm going to say throughout the New Testament, I find no other evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit other than tongues. Acts chapter 2, verse 1, And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared unto them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Notice all of them were filled. I'm of the generation that we used to come to the front and tarry until we received the baptism. But if I look to Acts chapter 2 as the model and the methodology, when the Holy Spirit shows up, they all got filled. So I'm changing my own mindset about that, and I'm saying if you're sitting in this room and you've never been filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but yet in your own mind you think you've got to come up front, have somebody lay hands on you, dump a bottle of oil on you, smack you upside the head, and kick you down so that your tongue will start flapping on its own, then you, you, you have a wrong ideology. You can get filled in the middle of this message and just break out into tongues right now. It can be 3 o'clock in the morning and you think you missed the boat and God didn't, re didn't release anything into your life. You didn't receive anything. And you might wake up at 3.01 babbling like nobody's business. You could be at work sitting in front of your computer on the job building fence, working on computers, doing whatever you're doing, and all of a sudden, bam. Why? Because God fills. Our job is to be open and receive. So... 
let's say you take a little baby in and they're sick and they need a shot of vitamin C. I love these doctors that come in and they play with them. And they'll thump them over here and they'll thump them over there and they'll get them laughing. And then without them knowing, they'll kind of smack them and then come right behind it with a stab and poke. The, the baby has no idea. The baby has no idea that they just got an injection. Huh? So sometimes God has to do that with us because we're up front and we're like, okay, Lord, whenever you're ready, go ahead, God. And he knows good and well we're not, we're not ready. So he waits until we're under a house fi- fixing some plumbing. Huh? We're on our back. And he says, ha, I already got him. Boom. Do you see what I'm saying? Because he's, he's been smacking us around and getting us laughing and thinking about something else, getting our mind on other things so that our spirit can... So before you come up here and blow a blood vessel in your head from trying to really receive from God so much, it, it's, it's a lot easier than that. They were all filled. Acts chapter 10, 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who heard the word. Everybody in this room is hearing the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out to the Gentiles also, for they heard them speak with other tongues and magnify God. Isn't that amazing? They realized that the Gentiles had received the Holy Spirit. How? For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. So even Peter, hearing others speak in tongues, realized they received the baptism. How? Because they were speaking in tongues that was edifying God. Now I'm going to say this. There is a holy tongue called tongues, and there is an unholy tongue that's demonic. Witches, warlocks, high priests, all kinds of stuff can pray in a demonic tongue. And it will sound genuine, and it will sound very similar, if not identical, to what we pray. And you go, well, how do you know the difference? I'm glad you asked. Part of the gifts that God poured out on the body of Christ is one of discernment. I'll give you an example. If you saw my truck running up and down the street in the neighborhood, 50 miles an hour, running over dogs and little children and bicycles. You might recognize that that's my vehicle. But discernment would kick in and you would recognize that's not Joel behind the wheel. Y'all catching this at all? So just because somebody has hijacked the vehicle, God help me, just because somebody's hijacked the vehicle doesn't mean God's in it. Remember, words are just the vehicle that carries the message of God. But if that vehicle shows up empty, God didn't send it. That's why you got to pay attention when you're praying for somebody. So I walk up, this has happened before, they walk up, I just need prayer. And the Lord will speak to me, they're not here for prayer. They're here to mess with you. There have been people that used to call me, that's why I've, that's why I've got the rule. Unless there is a lot of blood on the ground and it's a life or death situation and that blood belongs mostly to you, do not call me after 10 p.m. You want to know why? Because the enemy would send me people religiously, 11, 11, 30, 12, 1, 1, 32, 3 o'clock in the morning. Pastor, I just need you to pray for me. I'm just really going, I'm just having these bad thoughts. You mean the same bad thoughts you had at noon today that you never dealt with, but now you're by yourself? Those thoughts, it's, 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 the, it's the idea that the enemy will absolutely do everything he can to waste my time, kill my energy, rob me of sleep so that I'll misfire in ministry. So if I don't protect my time, and if I don't protect my rest, and if I don't protect my family time, 
then we'll get depleted and we'll drag ourselves in here and we'll regurgitate information, but the Holy Spirit won't be in it anymore. It'll be an empty vehicle. Why? Because we're not in a mind or a heart or a spirit in order to cooperate with him. I don't know why I'm telling you this, but I'm going to tell you this too. People that want ministry, Pastor, I just need you to come to my house. No. You can come here. Well, I don't have a car. Uber. I ain't got no money. Bicycle. My bicycle's broke. Walk. And you say, well, you're just being mean. No, here's, here's, I want you to understand this. If I know that I'm walking into a spiritual fight, I'm not going to the enemy's camp to do it. You're going to have to bring him to me because I want the home court advantage. Y'all don't hear nothing I'm saying. Y'all don't hear nothing I'm saying. Because this house has been prayed over and bathed and, 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 and the anointing oil has flowed and, and the presence of God is, is saturated into the water. You don't hear anything I'm saying. I, I want to I be on the home court advantage. I don't know who that's for. I'm going to tell you this too. Got a pastor friend of mine. Um, had somebody in his church that was having a really bad day. Associate pastor ran over to the house and called the pastor and said, hey, I'm fixing to go in. He said, okay, I'm just a couple minutes behind you. That person who called said, I'm in desperate need of prayer. I need, I need some I need help now. Associate pastor walks in. A few minutes later, the pastor walks in. A few minutes later, a gunshot went off. Talked to that pastor on the phone. I said, what were you thinking? He said, obviously, I wasn't. I said, if you had called me and told me what was going on, I would tell you, do not, under any circumstances, go in that house. You invite him to your office. You invite him to the church. You invite him to the sanctuary. You don't go there where the enemy's got free reign. I'm going to tell you something. There's rules when people walk onto this property. Even if they don't know the natural rules, the devil knows the spiritual rules. Y'all ain't hear nothing I'm saying. So he knows that when he walks across that threshold, he's going to have to behave. And if he doesn't behave, he's going to get not only called out, he's going to get cast out. You understand what I'm saying? Because he understands there's an authority here that, that's not there. If, if your kids at your house want to jump all over your furniture and rip the curtains down and hang from the ceiling fans and, and all that, that's fine at your house. When they come to this house, the rules have changed. And it's that way in the spirit. This was so not in the first, first place I did this. I, I have said this repeatedly, and I'm going to say it again. The moment you said yes to Jesus and you surrendered your life to Jesus, you surrendered, you signed away your rights to ever fight alone again. I'm so tired of people thinking they're super Christians, they're super man, super woman, super whatever, got the cape and the spirit, the anointing of God is all over me and I can handle it all by myself. You're an idiot, you're a fool, you're an accident waiting to happen because God said where two or three agree is touching anything in his name, there he is in the midst. God expects us to function together. He's not looking for Zoros or for Lone Rangers or for, he's not looking for that. He's looking for people that will take their place. Take their place. That they'll fill in the gap, that there will be a cohesive unit connecting this person to this person. That we make a fabric that can't be broken. We come at the devil like one thread, like we're going to come and get him. We're going to slice him up all by. When God has called all of us as threads to come together and to form a fabric together. You cannot say out of one side of your face that you're surrendered to Jesus and out of the other side of your face that I'm fighting alone. That's why there's so many pastors and ministers that are no longer ministering today because they had that ideology, that mentality, and they got destroyed. And because they were so isolated, the body of Christ never even knew it when they dropped off the face of the earth because they weren't connected really to begin with. That's free.
Number nine. When you don't know what to pray, Romans 8, 26, so too the Holy Spirit comes to our aid and bears us up in our weaknesses. For we do not know what prayer to offer nor how to offer it worthily as we ought, but the Spirit himself goes to meet our supplication and pleads in our behalf with unspeakable yearnings and groanings too deep for utterance. Do you catch that? With unspeakable yearnings and groanings too deep for utterance. Some people saying, well, that, you know, Hyundai, Shundai, untie my bow tie. You, you call that tongues? And this scripture is saying there's sometimes the Holy Spirit is doing so, something so deep, all, all that comes out is, and even that sound is where God is releasing a word to, to combat the work of the enemy. Y'all ain't hear nothing I'm saying. You really not. You acting like you are, but you ain't. Verse 27, and he who searches the hearts of men knows what is in the mind of the Holy Spirit and what his intent is because the Spirit intercedes and pleads before God in behalf of the saints according to and in harmony with God's will. We are assured and know that God, being a partner in their labor, all things work together and are fitting into a plan for good to and for those who love God and who are called according to his design and purpose. How many times have you heard that verse used out of context? Well, you know all things work together for good. What's he talking about? Verse 27, he who searches the hearts of men knows what's in the mind of the Holy Spirit because the Spirit intercedes and pleads before God on behalf of the saints according to and in harmony with God's will. So he's saying as we're releasing this prayer language, the Holy Spirit is interceding on our behalf before the Father. And because of that, all things work together for our good. <laughs> oh, God, you only missed it. Because the Holy Spirit is at work in, for, and with us, all things work together, not just magically. Number 10. God has released the baptism of the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongues for power. Power. I'm going to say it like this. In my humble opinion, 9.5 to 9.9 .9 of every 10 churches talks about the wonderful works of Jesus. Point 0.1 to point 0.5 out of 10 churches demonstrate the wonderful works of Jesus. And the difference is those that teach that works happened and the others that teach that works happen. Present. Most churches are teaching that the works happened. Past tense. How do you know that God's really real? Well, you know, back in Bible days, God split the sea and he. Yeah. But when somebody asks you, how do you know that God is really at work? Well, he healed my body. He saved my marriage. He got my kids back on the right track. He, even when I lost my job. Listen, there was a season in my life I lost around six to $7,000 a month instantaneously with no warning. I got a Dear John letter. That's a chunk of change. Never missed a house payment, was never homeless, always had a car to drive, always had food in our bellies. Why? Because God's faithful even when people aren't. Y'all ain't hear nothing I'm saying. So when you give honor and credit to God for what he's doing now, plus what he did then, people go, wow, what he did back then? He's, you mean he's still, yes, he's still doing it right now. Acts 1, verse 1. In the former account which I prepared, O Theophilus, I made a continuous report dealing with all the things that, which Jesus began to do and teach until the day that he ascended 
And after through the Holy Spirit had instructed and commanded the apostles from whom he had chosen. Verse 3, to them he also showed himself alive after his passion, his suffering in the garden and on the cross. What is he saying? After he died and rose from the dead, he showed himself to people by a series of many convincing demonstrations, which are unquestionable evidences and infallible proofs, appearing to them 40 days and talking to them about the things of the kingdom of God. And while being in their company, eating with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for, the, for what the Father had promised, of which he said, you have heard me speak. For John baptized with water, but not many days from now you'll be baptized with a with placed in introduced into the holy spirit verse six so when they were assembled they asked him lord is this the time when you will reestablish the kingdom and restore it to israel and he said it's not for you to become acquainted with and know what time brings i love that there are things i don't have to know or need to know or quite frankly want to know verse eight but you shall receive power ability efficiency and might when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends, the very bounds of the earth. And when he said this, even as they were looking at him, he was caught up and a cloud received him and carried him away out of their sight. He told him, said, listen, get down to Jerusalem and don't you leave until the Holy Spirit shows up in power. Why? Because without that empowerment, all you can do is testify to what Jesus did. But after the empowerment, you can demonstrate the works of Jesus. Jesus did greater works than everything you see me do. Will you do? Because I go to the Father and release the Spirit. So if the best you got is to talk about what Jesus did, you're defaming him by not being him today by receiving the gift that he paid the ultimate price for us to receive, the gift of the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongues so that we can function in the same power and authority that he did to do the works that he did and greater than he did. Jesus was not the lid. He's the foundation. He wants us to build off what he did. He said, look, peace be still. I calmed the storm. You guys calm storms. What do you think we do in Oklahoma? Look, there's a tornado. Get back up in them clouds and disappear in the mighty. How do we know we can do that? Because Jesus showed us on the boat. He said, I have authority over the storms. So therefore, you have authority over the storms. You catch what I'm saying? Jesus stood outside the tomb of Lazarus and said, Lazarus, come forth. He called the man from death to life. Why do you think we go to hospitals with people with the death sentence with stage four cancer? Lay hands on them and say, hey, I command death to die. But I command you to live in the mighty name of Jesus. Can I just say, if you're going to the hospital, you're praying for somebody, don't wait till the doctors leave and then go, in the mighty name of Jesus, I just pray, God, you bless this poor person who's on their deathbed right now. Lord, you just help them. Don't you do that. Boldness. Boldness. I want the doctors to be in the room. Lord, I know she's going in for an operation. I'm making this up. But God, this doctor don't know what to do, what you know what to do. So I'm asking you today to put that doctor on like a, pu like a hand puppet and that you would just stick your hand in his back and cause him to operate at a level he doesn't even know what he's doing to bring the healing necessary to her body that she needs to walk in. And I, you, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. How are you ever going to raise the dead if you can't kill a cold? How are you going to slay Goliath when you can't get out of your own head? Power comes from him, not another man, not another woman, not because you carry ordination or pastor certificates or graduation from so-and-so university, college, or seminary. None of that. You, you think God cares about that? The education he wants to know is, do you know Jesus? Do you walk with him? Do you talk with him? Do you pay attention to what he says? Do you give Holy Spirit access to your life? Do you step out of the way and let him use your body? Do you say what he says, even when it's contrary to what you want to say? 
Guys, there's situations that happen in my life that I'll, I'll, I'll in my natural man, I'll say, I'm not, mm, I'll stop. And I have to watch my words because I don't want to have to catch them, cancel them, cast them down. You know what I'm saying? So I, I, I don't want to give the enemy something he can run with. So I got I to gotta prevent the words from coming out and then change it to be what God was. If it be the will of the Lord. Oh, you see what I'm saying? I mean, it's, it's constantly you got to push that flesh down. You can't push that flesh down without the Holy Spirit. In my humble opinion, the world does not need another church, ministry, pastor, apostle, prophet, teacher, evangelist. Doesn't need anything until the ones that exist decide to do things God's way. Because what we've done is we've perpetuated ourselves instead of him. I'm going to say it like this. God, help me today. This is coming out totally different, isn't it? The people that, re that we release from this house for ministry, it is more important to me that you carry his DNA than mine. I want you to have my heart for people. I want you to have standards that I carry. But if you don't walk like, talk like, act like, dress like, drive like me, all of that's okay. As long as you are the original that God has produced in your life, then I can bless the God in you to be who God's called you to be. Does that make sense? I'm looking, I'm looking for the family resemblance, not like this, but I'm looking for the family. Do I see the father in you? Do you see the father in me? That's the family resemblance I'm looking for. I'm not trying to duplicate myself. I'm trying to duplicate him that's in me. I drive by, especially since we don't meet till two in the afternoon on Sundays, I drive by a lot of other churches on my way here. And if I gauged what was happening on the inside by what I saw on the outside, it would not be a pretty picture. If we found a fountain of youth on this property and anybody who stepped in the pool went back to being 25. We couldn't keep people away from this property. But yet we have the promise from the Father that once we graduate from this life, we'll never age will have a glorified body, will forever be in the presence of God. No pain, no sorrow, no tears, no disease, no sickness, no bills, no lack of sleep, no hunger, no thirst, no nothing. It's all glorious. And yet so many of the buildings that preach that are empty. And I'm going to suggest to you it's not because the message is wrong. I'm going to suggest to you it's because the ones preaching it are not demonstrating it. We are called to demonstrate what we believe. Don't tell me how you're supposed to love your wife when you go home and beat yours. Don't tell, don't tell me how integrity is such a part of your life that you take care of all your bills. And your kids are starving. Don't tell me how God is the God of all. But yet there's no power in your life. Yeah. 
Jesus is coming back for his bride that looks like him. All the other ones that bear his name and not his image, the devil will scarf them up. Well, you're just being a little fanatical. Listen, I would, let, I, I would far rather be overzealous for God than be like everybody else. Can I tell you, being like everybody else will take you to hell. Because your eyes are not on Jesus, it's on everybody else. When your eyes are on Jesus, everybody else is trying to be like you. That's our job description. Promote Jesus. Demonstrate his power, his might, his love. You want another, know another reason why I love this group of believers? Because when we go out and we pray for the homeless, I watch you guys. You don't pray for the homeless. You pray for the homeless. And man, I know they stink. I know they do. I know you're going to have to bathe about six, seven times to get that off of you. But you want to express not just in words, but in demonstration, the love of Jesus. That's why we stay so late after church and why Rachel and I find ourselves in the altar sometimes two, three hours after the last amen is given. And while some of you have been out to eat and thought you was going to eat with us, by the time you're paying your ticket and walking out of the restaurant, we're turning off the lights to leave the building. You want to know why? Because we're doing the best we know how to demonstrate Jesus because there are people in need. And as long as there's people in need, then there is a flow that comes through us, whether our bodies like it or not, there's a flow from the Spirit that comes through us to, to meet and exceed the need of people's lives. You've got to be accessible. I don't know why I'm saying some of this stuff. I don't know if this is for the Internet or for you or for both. But, but there's, too many, there's too many preachers and pastors and ministers that smell like a million bucks instead of, instead of like the sheep that they're called to minister to. We smell like you because we hang out with you. We look like you because we hang out with you. You hearing anything I'm saying? We're not untouchable. Because God's not untouchable. We have to be Jesus with skin on it for others that don't yet know him to meet him and to split hairs over whether or not the tongues is for today is problematic for me. Because the very ones that don't believe in the gifts and the anointings that I carry, when they get into a situation that they can't handle, they call me to use what they don't believe in. Let me sign off for those that are watching online and then I want to pray for those that are here. For those that have caught any part of this video, I'm so grateful that you did. If you're looking for a church home, we'd love to grow the family of God. 2632 Southwest 39th in Oklahoma City, Sunday afternoons at 2 p.m., Thursday evenings at 6.45 p.m. Don't let the empty empty seats tonight fool you. This is the 4th of July, and we still have a decent showing on the 4th of July because people wanted to be in the house of God. So we'd love to have you be a part. Uh, Come check us out. We'd love to love on you. God bless you. Have a great day.